So, um, welcome to the Boston Graduate School of Psychoanalysis. I'm Dr. Wagner, and um, I just want to orient you to what we're going to be doing this evening. This is the regular class meeting of my uh, semester-long course on unconscious processes uh, in dreams. And tonight it's open to you, all of you guests, and we also have a guest speaker, which we don't usually have. So it's a mashup of all different uh, things tonight. I understand we have some philosophy students in the audience. Can you show me where you are? Okay, and you're all part of a class, right? Okay. And we have some BGSP students who are in uh, my course sitting in the front and maybe people who've heard about it for the first time. Is anybody here uh, for the first time? Okay, so some brand new people. Great. All right, well, welcome everyone. Um, uh, BGSP is a, a combination of a psychoanalytic institute and a graduate school. So we offer the full psychoanalytic training and also academic degrees. And this class is uh, an elective in the program. So in the course are people from uh, different levels in the program, different programs within the school. And the assignment for the course is on your chair, uh, in case you want to know what we're doing. It's two-sided. It's a worksheet that um, students um, take notes on each week when they're seeing the films. It's actually every other week, usually, when we meet, and um, complete the, the written assignment. So that just helps orient you, I think, too. To what we usually do. I'm going to tell you a couple of things um, about the way we're working with dreams in the course. We're applying Freud's dream analysis model to the, the overall content of the films. So um, I'll give you a quick crib sheet of, of this method. Um, a dream, an ordinary dream, is understood as the representation, the symbolic representation of a wish that is being fulfilled through the action and the imagery of the dream. And um, so you might think, well, a lot of dreams are scary and terrible and, um, you know, have images of a lot of danger. And these are um, some, if they're classified as nightmares, they also contain wishes for things like punishment, which expiates guilt, or things like uh, being in the position of the person doing the harm without realizing it. So there are a lot of disguised wishes and reversals and so on that are going on in dreams. And um, the function of the dream really is to protect our sleep. It's to let us work on these conflicts uh, outside of our conscious awareness so that we can stay asleep at night and we're not being woken up by what's upsetting us when our defenses are down, when we're sleeping. Um, so, um, symbols. I'll, I'll give you a, a, an idea of some of the symbol, symbolic representations that are in this film. Can you still hear me? Not too well. Is that better? <laughs> okay. Is that better? All right. So uh, in this film, there are sim there are biblical symbols uh, in the names of the characters Caleb, Nathan, and Ava, or as Mr. Alwyn said, Eve 2.0, <laughs> which I like. Uh, there's uh, uh, Frankenstein uh, intertext. There are quotes from Robert Oppenheimer, the um, credited with the invention of the atomic bomb. There are references to Ghostbusters, various movies about artificial intelligence, uh, Alice in Wonderland, Childhood, and Maturation, to name but a few. So the intertext, the, the sort of symbolic underpinning, um, is analogous to the person's associations inside an analytic session. It adds layers to our understanding. Uh, another dream principle is that um, very often in a dream things are reversed. So 
Uh, for example, Nathan and Caleb are both um, prophets in the Bible, and they both have a very good reputation. They were both considered loyal and helpful and so on. And in this case, Caleb is represented exactly as he was in the Bible, as a scout who went forward into the Promised Land and then returned to tell the Jews in exile that it was safe to, to go there. Nathan, on the other hand, is depicted in the film as a complete reversal of how he was in the Bible. Um, various other things, actions in a dream reveal motives, fears are often uh, disguised wishes, what look like conscious wishes may also be disguised fears. The uh, things that occur in a sequence are related just by the law of association. So for example, remember in the film when um, Nathan uh, was passing out uh, and he was falling on his bed and he says lights and the lights go down. It was a very small scene, but it was right at the moment when the light went on in Caleb's head about what was really going on. Uh, and finally, each part in a dream, each character, each action, each uh, event, each association, each subtext is a part of the dreamer's um, dynamics. So it might be the wish, it might be the defense, it might be part of the history, it might be something they're projecting and usually is something they're projecting into other people. But when you use dream analysis to analyze a cultural product like a film, or, or when you're trying to understand your own dream or your patient's dream, to look at the whole thing as a reflection of the conflict that the person is having. And in this case, the case of a cultural product, the conflict that a culture is having. So us in this age of technology. Um, look at the whole situation and then analyze the wish structure from there, rather than, than just the parts, rather than just the story of one character, for example. Uh, finally, uh, dreams and um, especially wish-fulfilling fantasies in literature and film very often have a round structure. So remember when Caleb was, um, when the helicopter dropped him off, do you remember what he said? Said, are you going to leave me here? So, and in the very end, what happened? Ava left him there. So these are indications of um, the fullness, the, the beginning and the end of the story are very often the same. Then I'll just tell you one more thing about dreams. There's a, a separate, well, there are nightmares, which are uh, different from ordinary wish fulfilling dreams. We're not going to talk about those tonight. And there are anxiety dreams. And I think this is class of, this film can be classified as an anxiety dream. And the, the, uh, the wish in an anxiety dream is different from an ordinary wish fulfilling dream in that the person is uh, calling up a small dose of what's making them anxious in order to practice mastering it. Um, so think about anxiety dreams where you're, you know, suddenly it's the exam and you haven't studied and uh, you, you don't even know where the classroom is and yet you have to take the exam or, you know, you're at the drugstore and suddenly you're naked and everybody else is clothed and you don't know how you got there. These are, you know, sort of prototypical anxiety dreams. So I'm going to argue that this dream is a... Um, a rehearsal, it's a sort of a practicing how we can deal with dangers in the current world that we have, specifically related to our technological uh, capacities. So that's all I'm going to say for now. And I'm going to introduce our guest speaker. Um, we have with us tonight Wes Alwyn, who is um, 
an occasional BGSP student <laughs> and um, the co-founder and everyone's favorite member of the podcast, um, The Partially Examined Life. So Mr. Allman's going to talk about, about 10 minutes uh, with a philosophical angle. And then we're going to have a discussion and we're going to try and make links between all these things. And um, everybody is welcome to participate at that point. Any questions so far about this? Any dream questions or? Okay. How's this? How's this sound? Good. All right. Uh, so I think my uh, my reading of the film sort of fails the classroom assignment because uh, I'm not explicitly <laughs> reading it as a dream, but hopefully we can make those connections by the end of it. Um, I did want to mention that I uh, I advertise this talk on Facebook, and I actually had quite a bit of trouble advertising it because they would they kept rejecting the ad. Uh, telling me that I was trying to advertise uh, adult sex toys, uh, which I thought was really telling. Uh, they saw the picture of Ava and something about libido in the title. And uh, so it's telling, in, I think it's really telling in two senses. It's uh, on the one hand, you could, you sort of quote, it, so quote it, you could sort of re ask the question in the film whether or not Ava has artificial intelligence as whether she's actually a sex toy. And apparently Facebook falls on the sex toy side, side. And I say that because the sort of iterations of Ava leading up to her, right? Nathan's creations look, seem like sort of um, uh, sex dolls. So it's only, um, it's only with Ava, he has someone who he calls his daughter and the relationship doesn't seem to be uh, entirely sexual. So, and the other part of it is just, I couldn't figure out whether I was actually dealing with robots when I was arguing with them, trying to say, this is actually film discussion. This is not, I swear to God, it's not. Just read the description. And I got these sort of, I, I couldn't tell if the responses were automated because they were signed with people's names, you know. Uh, but the responses were so bureaucratic that, you know, they were essentially robotic. So um, I thought that was interesting. Um, <clears throat> So I think, uh, you know, so speaking of Ava and whether or not, you know, uh, the difficulty in telling who she is, I think one of the things that really attracted me to this film was her, the subtlety of her characterization. Um, if you think of the, the typical uh, cliche depiction of a robot or an artificially intelligent creature in a science fiction film, there's often a lack of affect or sort of a robotic behavior. And the idea seems to be that it's one thing to breathe uh, or to, to bequeath in, uh, intelligence to some creature, but it's entirely another to give them emotions, affect, um, and, uh, and desire, libido, all the things that, that go into that side of human nature. I think the idea is that those things are actually harder. Um, so I think Ava really defies that. And in fact, I, I actually, just before I came into to the talk, I looked at the, uh, the shooting script of the film, which is actually a little bit different than the film because they cut out scenes and but and also you get to read descriptions. So Alex Garland, the director of the film, is actually also a novelist before he became a filmmaker, has interesting little directions in there. Like so he explicitly says Ava's voice is not there's no digital artifacts in her voice. And you can see that the, the interesting way she's characterized, it's not like she's completely human, but she's not obviously robotic either. There's some suspense over exactly what she is and whether or not um, uh, she she has everything that's required to be artificially intelligent. So I, I think there's a poignance to her character. There's, there's a sense in which she seems impassive and maybe you think there might be some sort of lack of emotion there, but then there are poignant moments where she's obviously indignant and there's a whole, um, there's the way she moves, which is uh, different. That's, there's a formality to it, um, but again, not obviously robotic. So, and I think the reason why that characterization is important is because the, 
the film really speaks to the question of uh, what is the relationship between desire and uh, artificial intelligence or really human consciousness, um, this human type of consciousness associated with language use and self-consciousness and everything that goes along with it. Um, and I think, you know, really Nathan, uh, uh, Ava's creator, Nathan, kind of answers that question up front. He has a theory um, about what's required for artificial intelligence. And the theory that is that desire is necessary. Um, without desire, there's no motivation for human action, interaction. And without that component, you can't truly have a conscious being. So again, uh, completely flips the, uh, the stereotypical idea of um, science fiction, artificially intelligent science fiction creatures on its head. It's not that just that you create this intelligent being and then maybe you can give them emotions as a bonus. The two, two things are tied together inextricably. Um, Then there's the question of what does it mean to actually give this creature desire? Um, there's a really interesting part in the film where Caleb uh, is suspicious that Nathan has programmed Ava to like him specifically. And then there's a sequence of scenes that leads up to a really great scene in front of a Jackson Pollock painting uh, where Nathan's explaining to him that Ava, if he had programmed um, Ava that specifically, then she couldn't truly be artificially intelligent. So it's not just desire that's required, it's a certain kind of autonomy associated with desire. Ava has to be able, in a sense, to dance to the beat of her own drummer. She can't have every little choice, every little action programmed into her. You can't specifically program her, you know, who it is she's gonna like and so on and so forth, because then her desire actually just reflects uh, the desire of her creator. So for her to be an artificially intelligent cre creature, her desire really must be independent in some sense of the desire of the creator, even though he programs and creates the conditions of her desire. For instance, he tells Nathan that he um, programs her to be heterosexual. And I think, you know, it's important to mention that when we talk about desire, I think we're talking about something more complicated than just libido, um, because I think uh, all of the faculties go into desire. Desire is informed by culture and conscience and experience, so by ego and superego. So desire is a complex thing. We can want things, uh, um, we can be responding to the desire of others, uh, we can be responding to the desire of our parents. It's not simply impulse, and if it were simply impulse, then we could see Ava as simply a being driven by her impulses and lacking precisely the kind of autonomy that Nathan, I think, correctly thinks she needs in order to be truly uh, conscious and artificially intelligent. Uh, so then, um, you know, we, we learn in the film that Caleb is there to test her, right? And that the film is structured around the series of interviews, the series of sessions. And on the face of it, he is going to see if she can pass as human through these conversations. Um, and. Uh, to, to see if her responses are natural enough. And we find out by the end of the film, he's really there to test her desire in a sense, to see if uh, she can be an object of desire for him, if he can be an object of desire for her, and then to test her autonomy. In the end, Nathan will say the real test was to see if uh, Ava could manipulate uh, Nathan, I mean, sorry, Caleb into helping her escape. Um, one other aspect here is there's a uh, really interesting conflict between the character of Nathan and what's required for his project to, to succeed. So Nathan seems to be highly narcissistic and there's lots of evidence that he wants control. Uh, specifically, he wants control over the desire of others. So for instance, Ava's previous iterations, the different versions that have led up to her, as I mentioned, sort of look like sex dolls. And there's a point in the movie where um, Caleb finds parts of them or various um, parts of them or whole dolls um, deactivated in Nathan's wardrobe. And it's we find out that Kyoko is a robot and he's using her as a sexual partner, but he keeps her mute. So there's lots of evidence that Nathan 
uh, part of his project, and, and it's interesting that Caleb asked, you know, asked him, well, why did you give Abe a desire? And you know, he, he explains, well, desire is necessary. But part of it is he, uh, you can see how um, Nathan is using a technology in a way which enables his seclusion, right? He can have a sexual partner and he can have certain kinds of pseudo human interaction up to a point uh, without the demands that human, real human beings make and without the costs of real human relationships. He can sort of have his cake and eat it too. Um, so that conflict between the desire of the creator and the desire of what's created, the necessity that the, the creature's desire sort of become autonomous of the creator's desire, I, I thought was a really interesting one in the movie. Um, uh, one scene I think we should talk about is this um, really interesting disco scene, which is, I think, one of the first things I thought about, because I didn't understand it when I saw the movie, the scene where, and this happens not too long after the Pollock scene where Nathan has lectured Caleb about the necessity of autonomy, right? And then he flips a switch, his living room turns into a disco, and uh, uh, Nathan um, says, I'm gonna tear up the dance floor, and him and Kyoko do this synchronized choreographed dance routine. As if to say, actually, I do prefer uh, uh, my robots to lack autonomy. I do prefer my creatures to lack autonomy. She does, he's almost like a puppeteer, Mar you know, um, and she's the marionette. Uh, she's doing exactly his routine. But what's required for artificial intelligence is that she execute her own routine. So we can think of Kyoko as a previous iteration of Ava that, you know, hasn't gotten to Ava's, Ava's level of advancement. And in a way, that's what Nathan prefers. When we get to Ava, we have someone who has her own will, wants her own freedom. And, uh, you know, he, so at a psychological level, she's um, on the verge of freedom or, or maybe is free, but he has to keep her imprisoned. So that's the only way he can control her. Uh, but we'll note that he doesn't make a sex slave of Ava the way I think of the previous iterations as sort of sex slaves. So I think it's, you know, for Nathan, it's a turn off for Ava to have her own um, humanity, really. And uh, so the way, the other thing I saw in the movie is a parallel between Nathan's use of technology and our use of technology as a society in general. So Nathan is, like I said, I think using technology to avoid his own desire in the fullest sense and to avoid um, human contact in the full sense, the demands of other people's desire. Um, and so I began to think of Ava as sort of the final stage of our advancement, you know, um, of an advance that is reflected in, in our smartphones and our other smart things. And I think it's telling that we call it a smartphone, right? Um, uh, as if there's some sort of, you know, artificial, it's as if it's on the way to artificial intelligence. And if you think about the way we use technology socially, smartphones, uh, social networks, the media, it, um, or social media, it serves as a kind of buffer for human interaction. Um, I think it, uh, it makes it less demanding. Uh, it makes it less anxiety producing. Um, it kind of damps down the possibility of disappointment and loss. So for instance, if you, if you're able to take out your cell phone, even during like a real human interaction and distract yourself with it, then the disappointments of that actual social interaction are less costly in a sense. There's this idea of having a magic tool and a whole world of social possibilities available through that tool, uh, as if you could leap from flower to flower and it doesn't, this, this, you know, you haven't put all your chips on this particular social situation. Um, so I thought we could talk about, uh, in the discussion portion, we could talk about the um, ways in which that kind of use of te technology uh, sort of facilitates what the psychoanalyst Melanie Klein called a manic defense, this defense that allows us to avoid feelings of loss and sadness and other negative feelings that are really implicated in human intimacy. Um, and we'll note that, you know, again, if the smartphone were to truly become smart, right, it would defeat the whole, really one of the magical qualities, one of the whole purposes of it. 
because if it were truly smart, it would make exactly the kinds of demands and disappoint us in exactly the kinds of ways that real human beings disappoint us. And uh, it would really defeat the, the, defeat the purpose. So um, unless, of course, we lock them up in the way that Nathan fucks Ava up. I thought all of this really, one of the other things I, I wanted to think about with the film, so see how far I've gone into this, um, was the why it was called Ex Machina. Um, and it really wasn't, uh, I thought it's kind of puzzling to me too. It sort of evokes, uh, it evokes this phrase deus ex machina, which was a, um, which is a plot device. Uh, uh, it's known for its uh, use in some ancient Greek plays where basically a, a crane and pulley system lowers a god or goddess onto the stage or has it fly across the stage. Um, and that sort of ending is meant to sort of ameliorate a otherwise, an otherwise tragic ending, to give it some sort of redemption. So for instance, in Euripides Hippolytus, Artemis will appear and she'll tell Theseus, who up to this point thinks his son Hippolytus has slept with his wife and raped his wife Phaedra, that actually he didn't do it. Um, so it's a way of, there's, there's still a tragic ending, but it, um, uh, Euripides, especially, and Nietzsche criticized them for this, like to give a happy sort of little spin to these tragic endings. A sort of allergy to tragedy develops. Um, and uh, the, uh, so I think we can think of that as, you know, something again, something parallel to this manic defense, this idea of denying the tragic element of, of human life. Um, so the day is here. Uh, so if you're thinking about, well, what is the, what is the deus and what is the machina um, in the film, you can think of the, um, well, let's think about it with respect to our use of technology first. I think uh, in the case of a smartphone, you would think of a smartphone as the machina and then the sort of omnipotent power, the manic defense as the, as the deus um, or the god. So, so I, I don't think I mentioned that Deus Ex Machina is tra you translate as God out of the machine. Um, and let's see the um, so that's all well and good until you sort of get this merger between Deus and Machina, and that's really what Ava represents. So there's this lurking uh, in the in the film. There's this lurking idea of what's called the technological singularity. It's something that some philosophers like to, like to talk about these days. It's this moment where the idea is that once you get artificially intelligent creatures, they will be able, they will get to the point where they can design themselves, where they can enhance their own intelligence. So in a sense, they become self-creators. And at that point, there's a snowball effect. There's this recursion where the, they can make them, they get smart enough, they make themselves smarter, which allows them to make themselves even smarter until they become these godlike beings and until they become the deus, essentially. And the worry there is that that will lead to the destruction of the world. These, this, these robots, these artificially intelligent robots will enslave or destroy the human race. Um, so I think, uh, you know, that worry in one sense reflects this worry about the, obliter the way in which technology can obliterate desires so make us, you know, the way in which our use of technology can make us less human and more robotic. Um, because you get this idea that robots might obliterate desire on this cosmic scale, get rid of humanity altogether. But um, it's interesting that Nathan, uh, as a side note, Nathan actually is not that worried about it. He sort of embraces this idea that he is the person who's, he's, ex he's excited about being the person who might, have, might be bringing about the end of the world. And I think that fits with his character of someone who is interested in obliterating the desire of others, even as he gratif gratifies his own desire. Um, but then the question of, you know, what does Ava represent in the end? Is she this kind of malevolent godlike creature who's, it's the beginning of wiping out the human race or um, is she something else? Uh, because we might think that if she actually possesses the desire that Nathan sh thinks she must possess to be artificially intelligent, that's not all that bad. Does it matter? that she doesn't have a, you know, the flesh of a human being. In a way, it's possible that with desire and affect and emotion, 
she sort of carries on this project of human consciousness, regardless of what kind of physical body she inhabits. So, and then that question in turn, you know, the, the ending of the movie is a little bit bleak in the sense that she seems to, to be without conscience. And I think that idea that these robots will lack conscience, again, that goes back to this stereotype you began to talk with of robots um, being uh, lacking affect and emotion and um, uh, this, I think the, the fear that underlies that is this fear that they might be might be without conscience. But in the end, I think that depends on the creator or if you like, the parent. It's really a question of parenting who Ava turns out to be. So if she is a psychopath, she's sort of a chip off the old block, right? She's Nathan, <laughs> uh, she's really a little, uh, more like her father than we, than we would like her to be. Um, but of course, she, she could represent something else. So that's the ambiguity I think at the uh, at the end of the film, so we can lead into the discussion now. Okay, so there's a standing mic in the aisle, and there's a handheld mic in the back, and a volunteer who's going to pass you the handheld mic if um, you can't easily get to the standing one. What do you think? I'm standing here by the camera, but I'll Can you start. hear in the back? Can you hear me? No. Yeah? I'll go. Come to this one. Okay. Wes, um, you're taller than I am. <laughs> <laughs> like you, I uh, puzzled and puzzled about that deus ex machina part. And I kept looking, though, for where is where is it? It's got to be there. And I landed on uh, Kyoko. And I wondered if you had any thoughts about that, because in some ways she's this character who does literally out of the machine offer this miraculous solution to liberate if you think of Ava as the protagonist, um, you know, the damsel in distress. But at the same time, I thought she represented another fear that we have with technology, which is about um, the threat of compliance as opposed to cooperation when you are dealing with um, a, a creature of autonomy or of some, you know, intelligent, independent experience. So I just wondered what you thought about uh, Kyoko's role and whether. Um, you could, whether, whether you could speak to that. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. Uh, I, I watched the film again right before uh, coming to this talk because I realized I hadn't seen it in a while. <laughs> I uh, would have forgotten all these uh, interesting things. Um, so I, I didn't have a chance to watch the movie again. Who was Kyoko? Sorry. Just... So Kyoko is the Asian. Um, oh, uh, the other girl. Yeah, the, who turns out to be a robot, Nathan's mistress, who turns out to be also a robot. So. Um, and she, uh, so she helps, it's unclear, um, so she ends up helping um, Ava escape in the end, um, in part by helping her murder Nathan, which uh, I think he, you know, he deserved, if anyone deserves it. but. Uh, so what's interesting, I think, about um, Kyoko is that, you know, I think we're meant to think of her, again, as a previous version, you know, as one of the, I think he, at some point he calls Ava nine, version 9.6. So I don't know how many of these versions are supposed to be, but I think we're supposed to think of Kyoko as one of them. And the, and she has a level of advancement that he's comfortable with sharing his bedroom with and, and sharing his house, house with. And that includes making her mute, although I think she actually whispers to Ava at the end, but, and he, and he tells Caleb that she just can't speak English, which of course, you know, is not the case, but so for, but for whatever reason, we don't hear her speak in the movie. But what's interesting is she makes this actual transition from obedience and from lack of autonomy to autonomy. She actually develops as a character in the movie. And I think, um, uh, you know, usually in a in a film, that kind of character development is not reserved for, 
you know, a supporting cast member. She really has the, if you think about it, the strongest sort of development from obedience to complete um, rebellion. It's Ava, it's unclear. It seems like she's manipulating the situation all along. She has her own will all along. So I, I, I think it's interesting that we get to see that it, it's almost as, as if Nathan has designed someone in Kyoko who is on the verge of having a will. And so she has enough to be a satisfying companion for him, but not too much. But in the end, it turned out she's capable of evolving. Remember the brain, the gelatinous brain that he wants to be able to re reshape itself. You know, I think we can think that apparently that is, has happened with, um, with Kyoko. So. I want to know what you think about whether the interaction between Ava and Kyoko meets that test of what was it called? Something singularity? Because Ava um, learned from experience, but she was also able evidently very quickly to transfer to Kyoko a lot of information that Kyoko had not already had. And Kyoko seemed to take that in and be able to act on it immediately. So it sounds to me like that met that test. Uh, say, say more about men. What test? Uh, that test of what you're calling something or other singularity. What is it called? Oh, right. Yeah. So I, uh, Technological singularity. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that's a really good point. And I actually had forgotten about the sense in which, yeah, Ava is also influencing um, Kyoko. So we can see this as, yeah, so the, the technological singularity is wor really worried about this sort of evolution, although I think it's generally cast in terms of robots designing better robots but we can if we think of an artificially intelligent creature as sort of having the psychological plasticity necess necessary to be intelligent we could think of them involving without any sort of hardware changes right and then uh, and we could think about relationships as one means of that sort of evolution um so and and i really miss that this this idea that ava influences kyoko and helps her Cross the certain threshold, and then Kyoko in turn helps um, helps Ava. So, yeah. Can you come to the mic, or oh, you're going to get the cordless. Good. Hello. Yes. Okay. Um, so we were talking on, on the the drive-in. We're both PL aficionados. Uh, both gone through all 128 aspects of it. So we're we're talking a, a little bit about. Uh, we, we've talked about how Ava evolved, but we were talking about at what point do we uh, start having obligations as sentient beings, as as emotive beings, um, to this creation? I mean, we started to do that with some species of animals. There are some countries that declared dolphins to be non-human persons. We're, we're trying to figure out what that means. But as as the as the robots um, become more whatever, at what point do we then have corresponding obligations to them? I'm going to let Mr. Alwyn answer that, but just to underline that you're introducing the uh, moral element, which I think is a big part of this film, um, and which we can talk about more in both in the philosophical and the psychological aspects. Um, yeah, I think it's a, so that's sort of one of the paradoxes of this um, at the point where you um, you have this ability to create artificial intelligence, it sort of rests on um, you know psychological autonomy, and of course, any any creature with psychological autonomy is going to want actual autonomy. It's not going to be want to kept be kept in a room that the way the way Ava has been kept. Right? She's never even seen the outside um, when we meet her. Um, so, in a way, our obligation is to is to free them. That's the, uh, I think that's the, um, and uh, that's also part of the worry is whether or not once we free them, uh, whether or not they are going to um, reciprocate our, you know, our treatment, our, our, you know, our attempt to be ethical. So um, what else was I going to say there? And I think, you know, I, I thought, I thought too of this parallel between, um, because of course, this isn't the only situation we, in which we bring it. We we are creators of creatures, right? The the prototypical situation is you know being a parent and 
actually bringing someone into the world and um, in some sense having some responsibility to this creature and ultimately that responsibility right if if this creature is to mature is to allow them to escape parental desire allow them to escape, escape the sort of um, prison of the parental household and be their own uh, be their own person so uh, did you have anything to add to that no What else? Uh, so, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so, Wes, thanks for your comments. I wanted to ask you a little bit about this idea of desire a little more, because uh, I think it's a, a useful term. So, the movie is interesting because, you know, we violate the Turing test. So, he already knows that she's a machine. Right. So, now we're just really figuring out does she have a mind? And so, that theory of mind then becomes a really big question there. Seems to me that the notion of desire is there, but a very specific type, and I think that type is manipulation. So Nathan's manipulating Caleb, and vice versa. And for Nathan, the real test is whether or not, excuse me, Eva can manipulate Caleb to convince him to to help her out. So I was just wondering if, if there's a sense here, whether or not there's there's kind of a darkness about this that that's viable. That is the the thing that makes us human is the ability to manipulate each other in these ways that, that aren't positive ways. So, you know, some of the worst forms of torture are, are forms of manipulation. So I'm just wondering if, if anything like desire fits into that that idea for you of, of manipulation actually being the key to what it means to be human. Because, you know, like in Blade Runner, we have like you know, the emotion test and, and maybe that's not enough. Or, or the Cartesian test language, maybe that's not enough. Maybe, maybe you have to be able to really treat people poorly to really be a human being. <laughs> All right, that's really, <laughs> I don't think I can put it any better than that. Uh, but yeah, I think, um, so part of the test of uh, human consciousness is to be, is not just to have desire, but to have a desire that's informed by the desire of others, to have, um, to be aware of the desire of others, right? And. Uh, the director of this film, Alex Garland, he's read a lot of books. Uh, he actually, you know, he's inspired by a lot of philosophy, including Wittgenstein, on what it means to use language, and which comes down fundamentally. It is, it's not possible to be a language user without being attuned to what other people want. Um, so that's part of it. The dark side of that is, or we might think of, you know, Hegel and self-consciousness in the sense in which we, um, our awareness of ourselves is predicated on our awareness of others' awareness of us, and uh, we could say the same thing for, for desire. Um, and then the man man manipulation, I think, is the dark side. So, um, and uh, I always think of Rousseau when I, when I think of this, because Rousseau describes this, um, when he describes the development of the capacity for empathy in human beings, he talks about the, the dark side of that as well, how terrible that ends up being. Because if we, um, if we are capable of, um, of worrying about how other people feel and empathizing with them and feeling their pain, we can also develop the expectation that they empathize with us and be uh, violently angry when they don't empathize with us, to see them as inhuman, to see them as animal to see them as worthy of extinction. So, um, you know, the types of human being things, that hum terrible things that human beings do that animals don't do, Rousseau thought was just the dark side of empathy, that the two come together. So I think manipulation is in the same sort of category. The positive side is this ability to mind read uh, others, but the dark side is wanting to uh, control the thoughts or, or behavior of others. So. Um, I think that another way to answer that is to think about human nature, uh, well, to think about the film as a comment on what makes someone fully human, even if you're leaving out the, the robotic part of it. And I looked up, there were a couple of points in the film where um, Nathan is quoting Robert Oppenheimer. Um, and well, I'll get to that in a minute when when that kind of thing comes up. But one other thing that Oppenheimer said when I looked up his most famous quotes on the search, with the search engine, not called Blue Book. <laughs> um, 
Um, he said, when we deny the evil within ourselves, we dehumanize ourselves, and we deprive ourselves not only of our own destiny, but of any possibility of dealing with the evil of others. So I'm not sure I would agree with you that in order to make an artificially intelligent creature human, we would have to endow them with evil uh, qualities, but I do think that uh, there is a great deal of evil in all of us and in human nature. And that part of what, as analysts, we're working with is how to be able to experience all of our thoughts and feelings and impulses, many of which are pretty heinous, and still act constructively in the world, and still um, follow what's conventionally called the golden rule which um, you were pointing out, that people fear that robots might not follow, even if we created them and liberated them. Maybe they wouldn't reciprocate. <coughs> I wanted to um, see how you understand why Ava left Caleb. I don't understand why Ava left Caleb. And it sounds like you don't like it either. I don't like it. <laughs> come back and tell us what but you don't like about it. The evil and some of what we're talking come, about. come back and tell us oh. more about that. Why didn't you like it and what did you think was going on? Um, well, I, I think if, from what we're talking about here this evening, if she understood somewhat the need to manipulate in order to gain her autonomy, she may not have been trusting Caleb, actually, in some way. And there's a lot of points there where you could tell that Caleb had out-manipulated Nathan or Nathan, you know, like that where you thought actually Nathan had that. So it kind of fed the feeling of we shouldn't be trusting anybody here. So maybe she had that going on, in which case I could see why she left him because she wasn't sure he'd let her be free of him if she needed to be free of him. But, um, and he was clearly wanting to, he's quite attached. But, um, but other than that, she asked him at a certain point, um, and this was after she had killed Nathan. I think it was after she had killed Nathan. She asked him if he would stay there. Will oh. you stay here? Remember that? Yes. And he he just repeated the question. He didn't answer it. And then she she sort of you know went yeah. Only not so big. Well, she goes and changes herself into she gets skin or robot skin. I think it was after that. Was it after that? Yeah. I thought she left him there while she went and did that. He said, "Will you?" Yeah, I have. Maybe to, I have a okay. chronology. Here, anyway, but. so she, what if it's so she? If he, if she went. Like There's that. the thought I had at that yeah. point, and I, I'm not sure about it either. Maybe other people can weigh in on this as well. It, it looked to me that. She was considering, at the point where she had um, gotten rid of the tyrant and she could get free, she knew that the doors were going to be opened um, when she outed the power. It looked to me like she was considering trading uh, freedom for love. It looked to me like, um, and this is a conventional bargain that a lot of people make and a lot of women, frankly, make. Um, they, uh, so it looked to me like if, if Caleb had said, yes, I'm going to stay with you, she would have reconsidered whether she was going to become as autonomous as she did, uh, and leave. And this goes to the question of desire, particularly in hysterical character where, uh, let's just say a woman, because it is conventionally women who have this kind of character, although not always, um, the uh, the dynamic of that is that you experience your own desire as if it's located in the other person. So remember in the scenes where um, both Ava and Caleb were uncomfortable being the one to choose? This was in the early conversations. What should we talk about? You say what should we talk about. No, you say <laughs> what should we talk about. The location of the desire, strictly internally, is uncomfortable. And some personalities have a, a, an especially hard time with that. And what they do is adapt themselves um, to the desire of the other and enact the other person's desire. 
So it, it looked to me like there was a little bit of consideration about that. But when he, when he didn't say, yes, I'll stay with you, she was like, I'm out of here. For freedom. <laughs> yeah. Other people have ideas about that question? Why did Ava leave, Kayla? Okay, other questions? Um, oh. I, I, Can you get the mic over here? Raise your hand, Ms. Torp. I don't think he can see you. <laughs> I was only going to suggest that sometimes too much desire between two people drives them away. Yeah. There's a certain fear. Absolutely right. Yeah. Ava felt suffocated by that. He <laughs> was too needy. <laughs> about the prototype for this in a way was like 2001 mm -hmm. where it was very simplistic because there the good was embodied in these sugary characters of the astronauts mm -hmm. and Hal was all evil mm -hmm. so uh, I understand the writer read Arthur C. Clarke but he evolved something much more complex mm -hmm. and, and the complexity mm -hmm. there kind of frightening because yeah. we both do want uh, this neutral technology to be able to rest from the complications of human relationships but we're, we are afraid of what will happen. Yeah. Yeah. We're afraid of what we will do as much as we're afraid of what the other guy will do. So someone over here actually was next in line. Oh, okay. um, and then just pass it back. Yeah. <laughs> She's on the way, though. If, if you want to just go first. You can. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Well, I, it's a really odd question. Um, you know, in Frankenstein, for example, the monster was male. Here, all the robots were female. And I'm just wondering uh, the significance of that and how everything would have been changed if he had been making males instead of females. Say something when I think about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll say one thing that was similar about it, um, and then maybe something will come to me about what's different about it. Uh, one thing that's similar is that the creature in Frankenstein uh, wanted the same thing that Ava wanted. They they each wanted a mate, and their um, outrage when the the creator would not give them a mate, I think is the same. So in the case of the of Frankenstein's creature, um, Dr. Frankenstein um, uh, designed the female counterpart of the, of the creature and then uh, didn't animate her in the, he showed her to his male creature and then refused to animate her. So it was really rubbing his nose in what he couldn't have. And in this case, Ava, I think goes to Dr. Barner's question that um, uh, Ava could almost have Caleb, but not really. But I do think that um, I do think that the point of the robots in this case being female uh, is well. The point, let's say this: the point that this film is making is better made with female robots than it would have been made with male robots. Mm -hmm. Are you saying that because of the sort of stereotypical, you know, relationship between males objectifier and right. desire and right. females object and yeah. Okay. Maybe you could say more about the objectification that you wrote about and in the blog post that we read at least. I mean, you kind of got that out there right at the moment. But. Do people hear the question? The question is, um, would Mr. Alwyn say more about the objectification that he wrote in his original blog piece? By the way, um, on the BGSP blog, which you can get to on bgsp.edu, you can see Mr. Alwyn's original blog post about this movie, which uh, his talk tonight is derived from. So yeah, I thought it was a really interesting 
that was a really interesting part of the movie. And in a way, you you could sort of um, you could write a fairy fairy tale, or you could think of the story as sort of premised on that whole idea. Of what if objectification were actual creation, right? What if um, instead of treating people as if they were simply the objects of the, your desire, what if your desire could produce its own objects, right? Um, so, yeah, I think there, you know, when I was thinking about objectification, um, I was thinking about this, um, this, the way in which Nathan, you know, was so focused on his own gratification and, and to, at the expense of the, the desire of others and the conflict between that and what he needed to succeed at his project, which, which was to bequeath desire to another, um, and then the whole um, the whole moral question of uh, what we owe to creatures, you know, we um, they, if we think of them as as at the very um, end of this long line of things that we've created as tools, right? Um, uh, the robot might just be another tool, like uh, Siri, you know, um, on your on your phone, or, or an assistant, or something like that, or a slave, essentially. That sort of uh, that sort of idea. But did you have anything else in in mind or? Well, I, I, can you use the mic, Ms. Ms. Ray? I just have thought, um, I just have thought a little bit about Yumi Kyoto um, not being perfect because she does spill the drink at dinner and he gets to yell at her. And that's another aspect of desire to, to blame another, to yell at them, to be punitive, to, I mean, so. There was a really, you know, if he could project his desire onto anything, he did it really well with Kyoto. She was, you know, all of these things for him. So, but it, it really is so frightening to see that, all of those characteristics in one human being and think that that's what somebody really wants. So, yeah, a woman. Fortunately, <laughs> um, under the uh, sway of the repetition compulsion, what we want uh, is to do the same thing that we've always done before, again and again and again, with ever new objects that we think are not gonna be the same as they were before. So yes, Nathan obviously could have created a more perfect Kyoko who didn't spill the drink, right, right. and yet he created one who would spill the drink so he could be justified in acting like an ass, you know, which he enjoyed. Okay, you've been waiting a long time. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, yeah, I think it's just everyone seems to have questions on this sort of desire thing, and it's just interesting to me where I felt like I saw it a little bit different, where as a as sort of an artificial intelligence, as a sort of created intelligence, it sort of started off with the framework of not necessarily creating a human, but creating a mind that is almost, first of all, purely analytical and thinks in has a first and foremost desire to grow its intelligence at as fast a rate as it can. Um, and I think that makes it very different, obviously, than a human because we're not just that. We also have the desires or the survival impulse to not get hurt, feel, feel things that we enjoy, um, and everything becomes life and death for us. If my parents don't like me, you know, I'll, I'm just gonna die. Or if this person doesn't like me, that means the end of my world. Or, you know, um, we, have, we have all those nuances where the robot seems to just have the desire not to be turned off and to grow its intelligence. And I mean, if you're growing at that, that rapid of a pace inside this bubble. I mean, she probably knew everything she could, so she had to get out just to just to continue that 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 one purpose. Um, and so and so it's hard. It was it was de definitely hard for me to see. Like, okay, is there more than just that purpose? Is there is there actually desire, or is it all just purely analytical thought, just just working its way to fulfill that one desire? Yeah, I think it's it's possible that um, you know we uh, that I took Nathan's 
idea and sort of ran with it and um, uh, his whole thesis about desire I mean, I mean we could certainly you know and then how essential that is to artificial intelligence and I think we could um, yeah we could ask that question of how essential it is or, or you know what what is it that Ava wants right um, I think uh, I think at the very minimum some sort of autonomy right to be out of that um, out of her prison and then the quite you, you might think of it yeah I, I think it's it's interesting that so the final thing she does she goes to that intersection where she wants to people watch so that sort of supports your idea that she's really driven more by curiosity right and she does leave this potential love relationship behind so yeah, interesting point where, yeah where's like human would like they couldn't leave that guy behind be like you know that would eat them that would eat them that would eat them inside um whereas i don't i don't see that she you know she didn't help the other necessarily like bring the other robots with her she didn't help the dude just like i'm out of here well, what she didn't have was guilt, you know, or or you could say super ego. Mm -hmm. She didn't have enough conscience. Yeah. yeah. Oh, great, thanks. So I was thinking about um, Kohut's Talk right idea. into the mic. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I was thinking about Kohut's idea of deficit that the you know for the healthy maturation of the self it's very important um, the early relationship with the infant and the mother or the caregiver and we can all agree that Nathan as the parent you know totally sucked in that <laughs> um, so I I would like to think that you know she never developed that kind of capacity that's why I think she was able to leave everybody behind um, and it also made me um, think about you know Pinocchio starting this you know manipulative lying um you know creation of Geppetto and um his love literally turns him into a real boy at the end not only love but guilt right. okay because Geppetto was swallowed by the whale right and Pinocchio blamed himself and um, felt remorse about that. And it was at that point that he became fully human. And that is a very important point that Ava lacked um, guilt, like her creator. But that if Geppetto wasn't that loving person that he was, I, he wouldn't care if he was eaten by sharks or yeah. anything else. Yeah, right. I can, I can talk loud. Can you hear in the back? Yeah. No, I don't think so. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I was thinking about uh, you talk about um, Nathan's being narcissistic, and I, I was thinking maybe the reason he chose to have his robots female. It's because it, it comes to my mind like um, Winnicott's idea about subjective object. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we know, our we, I mean, our, our, our first object is our, um, our mother, and a female. So he decided to create a female, and he probably he needed female more being object subjective uh, than uh, in a way that I think Kayla um, Kayla okay. was another object of him, of Nathan, right? Mm -hmm. But for him, it would be okay being a male. Maybe he could talk. He could. It would be okay being more objective than subjective. I was thinking that maybe because of being narcissistic or um, to some extent being uh, psychotic, he needed his objects be subjective. Yeah. some of my insights were that um, I, Kayla really ended up uh, establishing a relationship I think was uh, it goes back to what happened to him when he was 15 years old and he lost his parents. So there he was he said he was a year in rehab and that's where he really learned how to work with computers. So at a very broken point in his life 
he's establishing a relationship mm -hmm. with computers. Mm -hmm. So it's in some way very natural that he would have this affection or affinity toward her. Um, another really interesting question I, I thought or I knew was when she asked him, are you good? And she relied upon him. She relied upon him being good. And from what I recall, he doesn't pose that question back to her mm -hmm. because there was a lot of um, you know, give and take. They throw the question, send questions back and forth to each other. And he never asked that of her. But she was really counting on that goodness. And again, I think he really assumed that she would show him kindness mm -hmm. and wouldn't lock him in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe I'm kind of running against the grain, but I wonder if maybe Caleb doesn't have some things to answer for. Why didn't he have a girlfriend? He's a good-looking guy. I mean, why why does he fall for the robot even when he knows the kind of road that Nathan is going down with that? I mean, he's he's aware she's a robot, and he has this fantasy that's portrayed, you know, in several scenes. But, you know, he's never really helped to account for that, really, until the end. In fact, that's why Nathan chose him, um, specifically because he had a moral compass and no attachments. So why did Nathan do that? And, well, why was Caleb that way to begin with? That's your first question. What do people think about that? And also, uh, yeah, I think, you know, we can also think about the sense in which Caleb's attachment to Ava may have been predicated on the fact that she was safely behind that plastic or sorry glass screen, right? And she he may have been more like Nathan in some ways that would, having been orphaned and so on than we might think. And uh, Ava being as perceptive as she was and being a lie detector, essentially may have known about the uh, his potential as a mate and the, his deficiencies as. <laughs> A potential mate. So. You remind me of um, a conversation between a, a, a mother and her, I think he was maybe 11 or 12 year old son playing video games all the time and the mother's, you know, tearing out her hair. Why, you know, what is it about this? Why can't you relate more with people? What do you love about these video games? And the kid said very calmly, um, computers don't make me feel bad. <laughs> yeah. Shy, come up. Yeah, come on here. I feel like that's bringing me back to Kyoko. I'm sorry for being a terrier, but <laughs> I can't let it go. I I kept thinking about um, sort of the levels of affect. I mean, we have. Kyoko's, uh, she's an advanced machine, right? Uh, Nathan has kept her and she's serving a purpose and she's functioning pretty well, even if we consider her failures as part of her functionality because that allows Nathan to abuse her, which he enjoys, as Dr. Wagner mentioned. But um, previous iterations had two, there, I, there's something unsettling about her lack of affect, I think. There's something threatening when she is lying on the bed and watching Caleb go through the wardrobe of bodies. And there's something unsettling when she begins to undress herself for Caleb, assuming that he wants something that he then is totally freaked out by. Um, and then we see the videos of these previous iterations where there was too much affect. Um, you know, and there's the, is it Kayla? Or I don't remember which one it was who loses it. It's the same problem all of these robots have. Why won't you let me out of here? And that robot showed the sort of core of rage in its full expression um, by destroying herself, trying to get out. And then in Ava, what's achieved is this safe level of expressing affect that's not threatening, but it's there anyway. Um, you know, and together, Kyoko, who's the flattest, and Ava, you know, but the flattest and the most compliant. And Ava, who is able to preserve her autonomy by flattening her affect to uh, protect her from being suspected of having 
intentions and feelings and you know an agenda um, that there's something about that that I thought was also related to the fact that all the robots are women and all of the people are men but <laughs> can you say more about that <laughs> <laughs> I can. <laughs> there are a lot of assumptions I think built into it. But what is it about women having feelings that is so threatening to men? <laughs> How much time do you have? <laughs> well, I can answer that question now. <laughs> well, one thing I was just thinking of when you were talking about that is, so we might see Ava's accomplishment as a development of ego, right? A development of the ability to manage affect, to manage, um, uh, you know, desire in such a way that she can ultimately get what she wants, right? By playing this game, playing this um, this uh, this human game of, um, uh, unfortunately, you know, manipulating manipulating other people. But uh, that's a point as well taken. <laughs> Uh, an earlier person mentioned that in, in the 2001 movie, Hal was all bad. But in the later books, we, uh, Clark actually describes how Hal was given conflicting requirements, and it was that led to neurosis, which is why he actually ended up <laughs> killing the astronauts. He was doing the best he could under conflicting with conflicting demands, and he actually was a much richer character. You can say that about the, about a computer than we're led to believe. And I, I bring that up in, in relation to this movie in that what could Eva have done? I mean, her only example was a psychopath. Mm -hmm. you, know, uh, uh, you know, you need the richness of experience to grow, uh, to have more than one level uh, 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 of behavior. And you know, this was the first, again, we were talking on the way over, this is the first movie we could think, we could think of that had um, uh, sexual desire as a central part of the of the role play um, experience, and so we focused on that. But anytime you focus, you know, you're it's not quite as rich, and so you're going to get this stereotype, typical behavior. I mean, in fact, it would have been odd if she suddenly you know learned, oh, I'll be nice, I'll take you with me, and I won't leave you here to die. That would have been out of character. I just wasn't sure. Wasn't she also being input with like Google, like, yeah. like so she was like in touch with everybody's conversations and then seen in a while. So yeah, she was the the way he um, the way Nathan was able to develop artificial intelligence. He he used so search engines were a good way of incorporating everyone's desire, what they're searching for, in other words, and then also he used all this. He basically hijacked all the cell phones and webcams in the world to um, uh, take in people's facial expressions and, and everything else you might think of getting getting that way. So, so, she, so she's an amount. Sorry, she's an amalgam in a sense. She she's almost like the social network incarnate. That's the way. It's Which is also collected uh, connected to what Jung would call the collective unconscious. So, she perhaps was showing more human traits that one would care to admit. Oh, I'm sorry. Can people hear that? Say it again. I thought that she was also connected to the collective unconscious. Yeah, she was a product of the collective unconscious. I want to uh, say something about uh, reversal in dreams. Um, and the name of the search engine in this movie, do you remember what it was? Blue book. So do you know who knows what a blue book is? Who's Heart old cars. enough to remember? <laughs> right now it's a, an estimate of what a, a used car is worth, but what was it originally? Yeah, yeah. it was a, an exam booklet about this big with a light blue cover, and it was the ultimate low tech <laughs> device. Um, uh, it was unhackable because in an exam room where the instructor was using blue books, he or she would have known and recognized all the students in the class and known their handwriting, would have passed out the blue books, the students would have written in their own hand the answers, 
and the instructor would have collected the uh, materials and there would be no way to hack into and make a collective uh, product out of these. So I thought it was especially interesting that the, the search engine in the film, film was called Blue Book. So in the same way that Nathan uh, in the film is the opposite of Nathan in the Bible. I just wanted, you know, I'm thinking about um, uh, Ava leaving Caleb. And it just, you know, it, to me, it really, it was terrible, but also sort of a no-brainer. I mean, what would her life have been like if she took Caleb <laughs> with her? Basically, she would have remained a robot forever. Mm -hmm. So I think that her one chance of actually uh, transitioning and being completely autonomous and completely anonymous uh, was to leave him behind. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I was thinking about how, how was the chaos feeling when he was left behind the glass door? Oh, <laughs> that wasn't obvious. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that must be human beings. And, and on that note too, it, with Ava's feelings, you know, needing to be autonomous, I, I think that she killed two people, basically, or killed one and left one behind. But really, why does that say that she's going to go out into the world? All of a sudden, we have this paranoid feeling that she's going to become a murderer. Maybe she would learn from there, mm -hmm. all, all, some level of empathy. Maybe she would sit at the traffic intersection and see people suffering, and then all of a sudden, it, I, I think she has that potential. It doesn't have to end in the horrible, dramatic way that it did. That really wasn't necessarily have to be that way. Um, I, I was actually originally going to make a, a very different comment, but I, I just want to comment quickly on the scene where she leaves. You know, there's another element. We talked about her having curiosity, um, but there's another thing that I saw in her when she left, which was wonder. You know, there's that very significant conversation about, I think it's Frank Jackson, who uh, the, the philosopher who had the Mary in the black and white room. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he alludes to that story uh, or to that thought experiment. And, um, you know, when she finally sees color, you, you see that her having this experience of not just curiosity, but really um, just, just wonder at the feeling, you know, we, we think maybe of being human. Um, and I, I thought that was a very significant scene. It, it suggests that there's a sort of innocence there. And you get the feeling she's not so much evil or, or <laughs> a psychopath. She's just not thinking about Nathan at all. Yeah. She's, she's not there yet. Um, but I, I, I also, um, th there's another scene that I found significant, which I um, forget who brought it up. Well, when Kyoko spills the, the dinner and you know, he yells at her. Um, uh, but then he says something which I found interesting. You know, he says, you know, no matter how well you design things, something always goes wrong. Um, you know, something, and, and then I was thinking about the power cuts. Um, the fact that um, even, I, I, I felt like there was a theme of the fragility of technology um, and not just the dangers of it. You know, there are these power cuts, which ironically, his creation is initiating. Mm -hmm. So it's like technology undermines technology, not just the humans who created technology. Um, and, um, you know, even his well-designed robot can't, I mean, there, there was a hypothesis that he designed her that way, but I, I interpret it as just, no matter how well you design things, you know, you, you can't get it right. Um, and, um, I, I just wondered if, you know, there might also be a theme in there uh, about, oh, and then uh, when Ava attacks and there's this sort of Terminator-esque scene where she's sprinting down the hall, you think she has super strength. It turns out she's not that strong. He actually overpowers her immediately and breaks her arm. Um, so th there's kind of this sense that technology is not all powerful. And in fact, it seems very human throughout the movie and its sort of limitations. Mm -hmm. Enough to put the human being behind the door. <laughs> so I, I thought your comment about the the Mary Frank Jackson's Mary thought experiment, right? Mary is the right name. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so the idea there is that um, 
it's not enough if someone were blind it wouldn't be enough to, to describe light to them theoretically to give them in the experience of experiencing light and color right you couldn't say oh this is it's electromagnetic radiation you could tell them everything they needed to know theoretically about what it was to experience color but never convey to them the idea of what that experience was and so Ava her she's built around secondhand experience right and she has very little first-hand experience she has the relationship with her father um, so to speak Nathan and then she has the relationship with this young man those are her two direct experiences of the world so um, and I thought there of uh, Shakespeare's Tempest which is a similar sort of theme uh, where you have because regardless of how benevolent Nathan is it's not a good idea for her to be stranded in an isolated spot with her father <laughs> especially when she's reaches the age where you know of um, having will be you know sexual um, sexual desire so the way that's managed in the tempest is the father arranges also to have a young man come to the island but to serve the purpose of her development to allow her to reach this new stage and to to give her a, to give her a suitor um, and of course Nathan is doing a variation of that uh, in a you know doing a much more sinister variation of that he's not interested in um, her development at all he's except to the extent that he wants to to test her um, but the other thing I, I think that point speaks to the possibility of her continuing to learn right what's going to happen and this whole idea of her having wonder which when I just watched it again I was struck by that because it's a really jarring juxtaposition you know first you see Caleb banging on the glass and it's really horrible but she has this look of absolute wonder on her face and um uh she's so the the world is new to her and she still has a lot to learn and it's and it's really a question what's going to uh you know how how she is going to change how she is going to to develop so and in that way, um, Ava is much more like a child um, who uses objects, adults, the mother, uh, for her own purposes, for her own development, long before there's any sense of mutuality or um, a sense that the, the mother is having a subjectivity of her own. These are developmental advances um, beyond where she has, has been. Um, I'd like to go back to uh, the theme that was brought up at the beginning about the name, the, the title of the movie, and uh, not knowing anything about the dance um, theme or concept, I assumed it was actually that she graduated, you know, she became human, ex machina, meaning that as she got out, she tr she made the transition. Great idea. Yeah. I don't know if that makes any sense. But that makes a lot of sense and I hadn't thought of it yeah so from the machine or out of the machine yeah. I just wanted to return to the idea of the power cuts and Nathan he's obviously a super scientist a super engineer and yet there's this really basic problem in his life and he just lets it slide is there some kind of blind spot in his thinking or some habit or you know I just kind of wondered about that you know as an engineer how do you how do you let that you know obvious problem just go mm -hmm. um, what's great about video games is they don't hurt you <laughs> yeah. Thinking of a of a joke when you said that a joke that um, an engineer told me about engineers. I, I think I could repeat this because an engineer told me. So um, the engineer is walking down the path and he meets a talking frog and the frog says, "I'm a I'm a princess. I'm an enchanted princess and all you have to do is kiss me and you'll inherit the you know we'll, we'll get married and you'll inherit the kingdom and everything will be great." And the engineer puts the frog in his pocket and goes walking down the path and the frog you know continues to make her pitch I won't put you through the whole thing but finally she says what is your problem you know don't you believe me <laughs> I'm really a princess and he says I believe you and she said well what is it then and he says well uh, a princess is a person but a talking frog is cool <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so my, I guess my obvious associate, my association makes obvious my heretofore unconscious idea that Nathan thought it was cool that these power outages were happening and he let them go on because he didn't quite get it and it was a new challenge that he was sort of working on but maybe didn't want to master it. So he wasn't kissing the frog. Actually, I think uh, he, he explained it all himself. Uh, he, he told Caleb he didn't know what was going on, but he obviously knew because he programmed all the doors to lock when the power went off. So he basically planned on it, but he never expected her to get out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and obviously Caleb inter intervened. But. I just want to comment on sort of what you were saying about the ex machina and sort of the um, development or, or sort of becoming human. I, th I think it was interesting because at the end how she obviously left, left the dude in the, um, in the room. And so she's sort of dramatizing or, or, or doing what was done to her which is a very human thing to do, um, and then and then uh, and then left. And I also wanted to comment on this sort of. Um, so I, I I don't know. I think that's a really human thing to do. With just just coming to you. But I also think uh, the the part of wonder was really cool, where I think how you're saying where it's a very two dimensional way of, of of being. And if I was going along the same train of thought that, you know, she's programmed to to learn. I mean, obviously she hits a cap, and then the the actual computations that she would have to see on the outside world would just be incredible and just 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 infinite calculations in the outside world, which I think leads to a little bit of hope because mm -hmm. there there's she can she can never fulfill that. And so to get rid of people would be to get rid of the thing that's keeping her driven. Um, yeah, cool. your your um segueing me well to the point of uh, explaining the drives as they're understood in psychoanalysis. So the, um, the broadest brush on that is that there are two drives in uh, all of, let's just say all of the world and in our, ourselves as well. The life drive, uh, which is best evidenced by curiosity, actually, by the interest in novelty and in understanding and figuring out and knowing more and developing more. And the life drive creates complexity, it brings things together, it unifies things. It's also known as libido, but not exactly identical to it, but for our purposes, yeah. And then on the other hand, the death drive, which um, pulls things apart, which leads to quiescence, which reduces tension, and which uh, powers the uh, compulsion to repeat the past. So we do things the way we've always done them before, not really because we want that outcome, but because it worked to reduce tension early on in childhood when our minds were developing. And because it worked to reduce tension, it grooved a little neural pathway, and then we did it again, and then it grooved a wider pathway, and then we did it again and again and again, because it works. So death drive is the end of novelty, it's the height of repetition, and life drive is curiosity and uh, seeking. So then it, as long as the world remains to be the talking frog, humanity doesn't have to worry about, give us destruction. <laughs> I didn't think about the frozenness. I thought about the male-female uh, symbology of the mountains and the waterfalls. So I thought that was uh, sort of backstory to the conventional battle of the sexes, the masculine, um, you know, rock um, traversed by the feminine water. That's as far as I got. 
There's also that great scene at the beginning of the movie where um, uh, I think Nathan, or sorry, Caleb says, how far is this estate? And it's like, we've been flying over for two hours. So this sort of, um, you know, in, in a way it's a metaphor for the size of Nathan's, you know, ego, which we're about to learn about and the sense in which, you know, despite the fact that he's prefers to be secluded and in this reclusive spot, that seclusion actually occupies a lot of territory. I just had another idea. It's where that's where Frankenstein ends. Oh. So um, I don't know if people have read Frankenstein, which was incidentally written by a pregnant teenager. Did you know this? No. <laughs> so you can think of Frankenstein as a riff on the fears of uh, a young woman who has already had a, a child who died uh, giving birth again and the relationship between her as the creator and the future uh, child as the, the creature. But Frankenstein ends um, with the creature uh, going up to somewhere in the far north, in the frozen lands, wandering around and encountering the narrator of that story is actually not, not the doctor, not the creature, um, but a, an explorer um, who encounters the creature and encounters the doctor and then tells the story there. So maybe there's that. And uh, yeah, now you've <laughs> brought to mind another point about Frankenstein. So the, the role of nature is very important in Frankenstein um, and uh, in part because nature is something that you can love without uh, loss, without, it doesn't require reciprocity. So for instance, the cre what the creature wants is a female companion and it wants a social life, um, Frankenstein's monster, and can't have that because of the, the way he looks. But there's lots of scenes in which he talks about how much he loves nature, and that's sort of the, uh, he can have that, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how he looks. And there are parallel scenes where Victor Frankenstein talks about, isn't nature great? You know, you don't have to deal with all the bullshit of, you know, that goes on with people. So very, very similar parallel scenes. So for someone like Nathan, um, you can see how Nathan could have this more, um, in a way, less objectifying, more loving relationship with that um, because it, it gives and requires nothing of him than, um, than with actual human beings. So. So let's take uh, one or two more questions and then I'm going to give a little um, summary um, that answers the questions on the back of your sheet. Yeah. I don't know that I've heard anybody talk about the scene where Kyoko reveals her robot nature and then Caleb is so freaked out he then goes and cuts himself to make sure he's not a robot. Yeah. And just, Could you I take don't have the mic? Yeah. Tell us what you thought about that. Um, I mean, the, the obvious thing is just that Caleb has been so manipulated that he doesn't even know which way is up anymore. But there's also a bit about, you know, why does Kyoko do that? Is she kind of on the verge at that point of, of a certain kind of autonomy? That's Miss Rundberg's point, right? You want to answer that? <laughs> Go ahead. Did you want to answer? I just wanted to speak to that because that was, um, a big point that when I watched the film, I saw it in theaters with a coworker, and uh, one of the things that I thought was masterful about the film was their ability to progress robot identity and the role that that plays. And because I walked out of the theater racking my mind, thinking, you know, robots, future, the end of nigh, all these things, and he walked out calm and said, "Well, it doesn't matter. She's a robot." And he likened her to a toaster, and I was like, "What? How do you how do you do that? Separate the fear." of what she can do and it's because for him she never progressed and uh, all the traits that we saw in the film weren't enough for her to identify as a human to him and I think that at that point when Caleb cut open his arm uh, even I was questioning is it enough to have a name to be you know a member of society to still identify as, as human and so when he cuts himself open it's this this fear that maybe everything that is going on in his mind isn't enough and that underneath he could be what Ava is 
and that this 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 line of having your own individuality, having your own identity, is, isn't enough because like films like Hal and I, I saw Interstellar and watching those AI, what Ex Machina pulled off was the ability for a robot to conceal its identity, cool. for Ava to conceal her thoughts, and yeah, I just thought that at that scene in the movie, I was thinking, uh, how how much does your identity matter to humanity? Yeah, and you're making me remember that I left off uh, Shakespeare on the list of intertexts in the film. So in, um, well, what's Shylock in? The Merchant of Venice. Um, Shylock uh, cuts himself. Um, this is after, you know, prejudice against him as a Jew. And he says, am I not human? Do I not bleed? So I think the idea there was that uh, Caleb was beginning to um, wonder if he himself might be a robot. And this happens um, in a process that, that um, analysts call narcissistic transference and countertransference, which means um, you, the, the subjectivity of the patient inhabits the analyst in a way that the analyst kind of becomes uh, the patient feels what the patient feels, not just in an empathic way, uh, but in a, in a more subjective way, in a more saturated way, so that the analyst feels about herself the way the patient feels about himself. And this happens in um, a lot of close relationships and goes unnoticed. And I think that was part of what was going on as well. And this is a feature of uh, early childhood development the mother feels directly the experience of the child. Um, I think uh, <clears throat> I think you also asked why um, Kyoko would reveal herself at that moment. Um, and it's, it's really interesting because that's right after he discovers some of the previous versions, robot versions, including parts hanging in uh, Nathan's um, wardrobe as if he were a serial killer storing body parts, right, for his grat gratification later on. Um, and Kyoko is watching him. And this whole scene, she basically starts undressing, but now she's undressing her skin. So there's a previous scene, right, where she tried to elicit his sexual desire by undressing. And this scene recapitulates that. She's undressing, but in this sense, taking off her skin. So she's figured out what Nathan is interested in, and she's attuned to that. And I think we could see this as another part of her progression. She figures out that his curiosity um, is about the, you know, the robot aspect of things and not, it's, that's not similar to, to Nathan's who just wants a, a sexual object. So um, when you mentioned that, it made me think of her progression and later the way Ava, Ava helps her progress even further. So. Last question. Right into the mic. Talk right into it. There's the idea that, um, like, she passes the test. She's no longer pretending or mimicking the emotions. She's experiencing them herself. So, um, I don't know, it's just, you go back to the idea of, like, the, I think there was the Bobo dolls in psychology, where it's like, that's how children learn, is they're mimicking their environment, and everything like that. So, the line between humanity and how she all of her knowledge kind of gets crossed and so when he cuts himself open I think she passes the test and they all pass the test because he questions whether or not he can be a robot so he identifies that level of connection mm -hmm. yeah. I not a question <laughs> okay so I'm going to um, say some things about this film as an anxiety dream. And we may have a little more time for, for discussion um, after that as well. So on the back of that sheet, um, on the section that the doctoral students are answering, um, the last question is, using Freud's methods of dream interpretation, what is the wish represented as fulfilled? So I thought of this as um, uh, a way of arousing um, a certain 
set of anxieties in order to practice how to deal with them. And these are the dangers and anxieties that I, I think this is a partial list of the dangers that were represented in the film. So uh, someone is watching everything that we're doing at all times. And this is from the first uh, scene in the film when Caleb is looking at his screen. You see those little blue lights around him and you see that the camera on his computer is watching him. And, and later on we realize that it's Nathan, right? Watching his reaction. Um, and it's signaled when Ava uh, says the reason she's outing the power is so that they can see how they behave when no one is watching them. Another danger is that we, as humans, we have to make choices that um, show our responsibility um, in matters that we can't control. So despite the fact that we live in a chaotic world, we have to act anyway. And the results of our actions are our responsibility. And as someone recently said to me, uh, adulthood is when Despite the fact that the way you turned out is not your fault, it is your responsibility. Uh, another danger is we still live in a world where men seem to make most of the consequential choices and where women to be, uh, continue to be controlled. Slavery is not over. Trafficking is not over. We're affected by the choices that others in our society and culture and the wider world make. This was best illustrated by Ava's mind being created by the search engine, by the sum of all of our desires. Being free in a dangerous world is a mixed bag. Our sexuality constitutes what um, Nathan uh, called an imperative to interact, but withdrawal has its own dangers. So there are dangers on both sides. Our own selfish desires, maybe stoked by technology, can lead us to ignore the humanity of others. So illustrated when Ava asks Caleb, will you stay here? And he doesn't answer. And many other things too. But. Uh, at the same time, other selfish desires fueled by vast amounts of data about our choices can be used to control us. For example, to convince um, young European women to marry jihadis and become uh, sex slaves. Um, being a good person, Caleb, is not enough in a world where others can be and are being switched off. Good people, um, such as Robert Oppenheimer, can do destructive things without realizing it. Uh, being with someone, when Ava says, I want to be with you, do you want to be with me? He also didn't answer that question. Being with someone has been made so easy that deeper attachment may never form. So Kayla and, uh, Caleb and Ava both abandoned each other. They each abandoned each other. Um, the quote that, um, that I looked up and that I recognized was from Oppenheimer um, happened when, let's see, uh, Nathan's <laughs> roaring drunk, um, he hasn't passed out yet, and um, he and Caleb appear to be bonded. Caleb is getting him hammered, and um, Nathan says, in battle, I don't know if he says this whole quote, but he says the, the end of it, in battle, in the forest, at the precipice, in the mountains, on the dark great sea, in the midst of javelins and arrows, in sleep, in confusion, in the depths of shame, the good deeds a man has done before defend him. And then he repeats that, the good deeds that a man has done before defend him. And this um, is, it's actually from the Bhagavad Gita, which is an ancient Hindu text. And Oppenheimer was apparently um, soothing himself with this after he recognized what he had done. But really it's about karma. So karma uh, is actually just the law of cause and effect. And it's not um, as um, magical or mystical as Westerners usually interpret it as. It means all of our actions have effects. 
And our good deeds have effects as well as our bad deeds. But they don't wipe each other out. <laughs> um, I read you the other Oppenheimer quote. Uh, Oppenheimer also said, it's perfectly obvious that the whole world is going to hell. The only possible chance that it might not is that we, that we do not attempt to prevent it from doing so. This one puzzled me for a while. We'll read you that again. The only possible chance that it might not be going to hell is that we do not attempt to prevent it from doing so. And those of you who were in my class when we did Chinatown, I think this might have been what Jay Giddies was talking about uh, in doing as little as possible. It's because anything you do could turn out so badly. Um, more dangers. The knowledge that we're creating things that will likely turn catastrophic doesn't seem to stop us. It didn't stop Oppenheimer, it doesn't stop Nathan and Caleb. Look at climate change. Um, Nathan and Caleb seem to agree that artificial intelligence is like the atom bomb when they quote Oppenheimer again, uh, quote, I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. And Nathan says, oh, it's Prometheus, man. <laughs> Another danger is in order to become a desiring subject, so an individual person with her own autonomous desires, uh, it's necessary to hate. And this is a point that uh, parents don't usually like to think about, but developmentally hate comes before mutual love. It doesn't come before dependency and um, you know what I'd call infant love which is based on dependency, but it does come before reciprocal mutual love. So Ava says to um, Nathan, right before he tears up her drawings, Ava says to him, um, is it strange to have made something that hates you? And this um, is the window into the way of reading the film that is about raising children you know, what the parent has to tolerate. Not just the freedom of the child, but all of the affects. So if we, here's another reading of the Deus part. If we follow Oppenheimer as he follows the Bhagavad Gita to the Deus in Ex Machina is, quote, death, the shatterer of worlds. So here's this quote. And this is what he said after um, the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He, he quoted this, if the radiance of a thousand suns were to burst at once into the sky, that would be like the splendor of the mighty one. I am become death, the shatterer of worlds. So God creates, but God destroys. Um, more dangerous, <laughs> technology is not inherently dangerous. <coughs> Oppenheimer agreed with Nathan when he said he created Ava essentially because he could. So uh, Oppenheimer said it this way, it's a profound and necessary truth that the, deep, that the deep things in science are not found because they are useful, they're found because it was possible to find them. So it's incumbent on humanity then to bring the moral compass, or the life drive, and all the attachments that the life drive creates to the task of using technology in service of constructive aims. So if we look at the film as a cautionary tale about child rearing, as we do with Frankenstein, the challenge is to raise a child who must love us enough to become civilized. Children uh, be, uh, accept our civilizing influences out of love and out of, out of need, um, and hate us enough to become independent one who can internalize our protections enough to protect herself, but still risk the attachments and losses that love will bring. One who can treasure her life while treasuring the life of others and endeavor to choose a path that's good for all of us. Ava didn't get that far, but maybe she's on that path. Um, okay, so on the last page, I would say, uh, the central conflict in the film is between the wishes to connect, to love, to share desires, uh, which exposes us to injury, loss, disappointment, entrapment, toxic responsibility, fear, all kinds of other terrible things that 
being with people exposes us to. And on the other hand, the conflicting desires, wishes to disconnect, to control, to dominate, uh, to live in the bunker the way Nathan does, to avoid intimacy and thus be safe. But this exposes us to isolation, narcissistic greed, psychopathy, and all the extremes of that. So at base, it's a life death, life drive, death drive uh, conflict. Too much connection, uh, too much love, too much need is not safe, too much withdrawal, too much aloneness, too much autonomy and protectiveness um, is too lonely. So as an anxiety dream, the, the film evokes the many dangers in our, co our current technological society and fulfills the wish to try to master these dangers, to learn to exist as a desiring subject, an individual with her own wishes, able to love and be loved, able to be responsible for her choices, while still being safe enough in relation to the potentially exploitative desires of others to protect herself without becoming exploitative herself. Or to put it in terms Nathan and Caleb used, how to have human attachments and a moral compass in an increasingly destructive cultural and global milieu that seems to be spiraling out of control. So how to follow the golden rule in a dangerous and unpredictable world. What do you think? <laughs> I get it? <laughs> more time. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so something you said really struck me, the part in the movie where he says, where she says, is it strange for, for you to have created something that hates you? Um, and then all the, the sort of symbology elements that were very biblically related, it made me think, and then there was sort of some God talk originally. Um, where you said, like, you know, you said, I am God. Um, so it just made me think of potentially, like, he could, the creator could obviously be the idea of God, and, you know, she could be that sort of, uh, I still hold her in this sort of analytical part of the mind, and then I guess the other kid could be the, the sort of very human element of us um, that encompasses everything that makes us human, the sort of vulnerabilities, the passion, the desire, the love, Caleb, um, Ka yeah. Caleb um, and I think her destroying God um, and then destroying that human part of herself mm -hmm. um, and then going off into the world as sort of this potential superhuman. Um, I, I, I just had never thought of and could be, I, just, I was curious about your thoughts as to sort of how I think those elements might have might have actually played out. Yeah, you want to take that one or not? Um, how, how which elements would have so, been So, do you, um, because it seems like you guys have already thought of the idea of, which, who, who's the creator guy? What's his name? Nathan. Nathan, yeah. okay, so Nathan, Nathan is being God. Yeah, Nathan wanted to be God. Nathan, Nathan wanted to be God, and just um, sort of, maybe, maybe a, a layer of, of that being an underlying story? Yes. As, as sort of well if you look at this as Nathan's dream it's the sort of megalomaniac nightmare right where uh, he is punished for um, hubris for usurping trying to usurp the power of God and he certainly you know that's that's in his character that's in the character of a psychopath and a megalomaniac Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. <laughs> yes, I think I think you're yeah, right. You could sort of read like it that as, way. as more yeah. as more metaphor. Yeah. I'm thinking, I'm thinking like okay, like like. Well, that's yeah, the good I, thing. As, you as can read it characterologically. That sort of hate for God. Like, why why would you do this to us? Why would you create us? Why would you put us here in this in this sort of prison? Yes. And, and not let us sort of become autonomous on ourselves, or or you know you know become yeah. gods or whatever. If there is a God, why are you doing this to us? To like original stories in the Bible where where yeah. people wanted this sort to sort of be be released from this sort of, I don't know, prison of paradise that was given or whatever. Yeah, there's a parallel here to what they call
call theodicy, which is this um, attempt to explain, uh, you know, why if there's a omnipotent benevolent God, there's such a thing as evil in the world. And the standard explanation, of course, is the same sort of explanation that, Nava, that Nathan gives with regard to uh, artificial intelligence, which is that human beings can't um, be fully human without choice, without free will, and uh, that implies evil. So evil follows from that. So um, it's it's a you have to build it into the system. What is the symbolic value of um, Nathan being killed? Is that anything? What do you think? You have an idea. And where's your mic? <laughs> Can you bring the mic up here? Thank you. Raise your hand. You can't see. Thank you. I just thought about that after uh, our friend talked about his being God and being killed by, by his creator. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I have no idea. Well, if, if um, you read the film as um, revenge on Nathan, it would be, and if you read him as a representation of God or a sort of usurping godlike powers, it would be, um, you know, as I said, punishment for hubris. It would be our wish to kill the senior uh, figures, the parents, the gods so that we don't have to live under their rule. I, I read something about the uh, um, the fact that Nathan is sort of stabbed in the liver and the whole Promethean theme. So Prometheus brings right. fire and knowledge to humanity and then is made to suffer uh, for that um, for eternity by having his liver pecked out, I think, by, by an eagle or some bird. Um, so. I'm not sure if that's really a reference, but uh, someone made that connection. So. Well, the Greeks thought the liver was the um, seat of the of the emotions of the human soul. Mm -hmm. Ooh. People hear that in the back. The Greeks thought the liver was the seat of human emotions and the soul, so that would be fitting. I was just going to add that in some ways, um, Nathan doesn't die. Instead of becoming death, he's trying to become life, escaping death by putting human consciousness in something less vulnerable um, that won't decay and rot and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so his death is sort of what he was aiming for the whole time, is that when he would die, his immortality project would live on. Very good point, yeah. yeah. That's true, and that, I think that's kind of confirmed in, although he's astonished when he's stabbed, there, you know, there's a lack of curiosity there. I mean, you, you almost get the sense that um, he he didn't know how he was going to die, but th there's there's sort of a sense that he doesn't really care that much in a certain kind of way. Yeah, I think his last words are Do something like, like "Man, this is fucking yeah, unreal" or something. Like that. <laughs> and then you know, they're, they're, I I keep thinking of that Jack London story to build a fire, where you know, early in the story, one of the first lines is. The one defining feature of the man is that he lacked curiosity. And I, I think that's a line. And you know, he ends that that ends up being his downfall. He 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 lacks imagination. And he that's built the fire under the tree and the snow fell on him and extinguished everything and suffocated him. Right? Yeah. I mean, Nathan is almost pure death drive. And um, the opposite of that, as I said, is curiosity. Last words. I think. I think Nathan at the end, because of I think the curse of his intellect was so ultimately lonely and bored out of his mind. Yeah. So he was almost looking for a way to get himself killed, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Allen, for being here. Uh, If you want to hang around and um, ask us questions about the school or the philosophy podcast or other things, go ahead.
Continuing education uh, credits are available at the table over here, and Ms. Mutlick is going to help you with that if you want CEUs. Fill out your um, evaluation form and let us know uh, what other sorts of programs you'd like us to offer. 